Um, thank you, everybody, for coming today. This is On the Ground Reportage and Narrative. My name is Chris Mountner. Um, I'm an occasional critic and uh, covering the comics scene for the journal and various other places for a while now. Um, on my day job, I am a social media producer as well as some occasional reporter and copy editor for the penlive.com. Um, so we're here today to talk about uh, journalism, reportage, on, on the scene reporting, comics, editorializing op-eds, and all kind of how that all blends together in, uh, in, in the comics medium. Um, and with me today are four very talented people. Um, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, starting with Josh, if you could. Sure. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm Josh Kramer. Uh, I, for a long time, did a self-published a anthology called the Cartoon Picayune, um, and now I do a newsletter called uh, the Kojo List. Uh, and I just, um, I guess, I'm pretty evangelical about this stuff. I really love comics and journalism together, and I've been doing it freelance uh, for six or seven years. And um, yeah, probably good, right? Yeah. Cool. Um, I'm Ben Passmore. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I've been working uh, for the Nib for the last couple of years. I guess I would describe myself more as an essayist, um, but writing about um, grassroots resistance movements, uh, anti-fascist things like that. I also wrote a short comic called Your Black Friend, which I'm probably more known for. Um, yeah, and I'll talk more about other stuff. Hi everyone. I'm Wit Taylor. Um, <laughs> sorry, I forgot my last name. Um, so yeah, I've been doing a variety of comics. I started off self-publishing, doing autobio, which I still do. But more recently, for the past few years, I've been doing um, also comics essays for the Nib. Um, a lot of stuff around race, gender, identity, and um, more recently, public health. Um, and yeah, I also do uh, work for other um, websites, such as like the New Yorker and stuff like that. My name is Mike Dawson. Um, I also uh, do quite a bit of work for the Nib. I'm, I mostly write editorial comics, um, stuff that's topical, um, but sort of a mix of autobiography um, as well as opinion. Um, and I have also written some graphic novels, one of which was a was a memoir about about Queen. But that's not what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, to start with, and this isn't me playing gotcha, but I'm just curious. Outside of comics, did you have any kind of experience? you know, in, like, whether as an essayist or writing op-ed or, like, in, in the world of journalism or, or um, reporting or magazine work, like, whether it was, you know, a day job working at the school paper or, you know, working as a freelancer for the weekly, the weekly that gets thrown on the driveway or anything like that. Um, did you have any background on, on uh, guys have any kind of background in that at all? Should we just go down? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I went to journalism school here in D.C. I went to American University, and I, yeah, school of communications um, before I wanted to make any comics and did high school newspaper, stuff like that. But, um, yeah, no, never worked on any staff, um, and, yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, in in college, I, <laughs> I did, um, like, a zine. Uh, I organized a zine that was about um, a response to our art school's um, uh, participation in the gentrification of Savannah, Georgia, um, which I got academic probation for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, <laughs> and they've not asked me back to talk or anything. Um, and uh, and um, and then I moved to New Orleans after that, and I uh, I core organized a uh, a radical journal. Um, it was during. The, uh, the BP oil spill, um, and we were, in many cases, the only people really writing extensively about fishermen blockading um, BP, um, organizing uh, a flag burning in Grand Isle, uh, a BP flag, um, also an American flag. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, so that yeah, that was mostly my my experience uh, writing about stuff outside of comics. I mean, I will admit to being more of a propagandist than a journalist. Um. <laughs> um, I don't have, I guess, formal journalistic ex experience. I mean, I have written about comics. I've done a little writing for the Comics Journal and Panel Patter. Uh, I used to do some comics reviews, um, but in terms of like communicating about 
trying to communicate ideas. I have a background of a master's in public health, and I have a background as a clinical health educator, so I had to kind of learn how to communicate difficult ideas to people uh, about health. So I guess that would be my closest link. Uh, you got me. You got me. No. <laughs> um, uh, outside of comics, my uh, a lot of my day job work has been in online education. Um, I don't have much of a background in journalism, but I I've done a lot of work in uh, creating uh, online on, online material for education, like um, like putting together audio and visual and mm -hmm. word words and images. Um, and I felt like that like that what I was doing in that like uh, so I think sort of prompted me along into this direction of like sort of making arguments through comics and using comics to try to make uh, opinions put opinions um, as, as like I think a very sort of effective way to to write about um, to put opinions out there um, so that is sort of my outside of comics experience but it really isn't journalism so I won't pretend otherwise. <laughs> well, jumping on that, um, kind of one of the reasons I asked that question, because I'm curious as to influences. And because I think when we talk about comics journalism, there's some very obvious names to come to mind. But I'm really curious what, for you, in doing, whether it's doing like an essay work for the Nib or something, what, who you draw upon specifically for that kind of work. I'm not even talking about like who your influence is in general in terms of making comics, but in terms of, you know, getting your point across in terms of writing a good comics essay or covering a scene or, or writing about something like that in comics, who, whether in the prose world or in the comics world, are you looking to? I think when we talk about comics journalism, it's like Joe Sacco and the conversation stops there. And I'm betting with the four of you, there are a lot more people that you think of when you're looking to do a story. Mm. Does anyone want to start? <laughs> uh, I, for me, I like a lot of the um, kind of old school, new nonfiction guys. Um, John McPhee is a big one for me. Um, I look to prose a lot for journalism influences, yeah. But yeah, Sacco is big, and um, Josh Neufeld is big for me, personally. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, Sarah Glidden is, a, yeah. I think, does amazing um, like reporting yeah. with comics. And obviously has done quite a lot of writing about uh, journalism and comics. Ooh. Sarah Glidden. Uh, she did a book called Rolling Blackouts. Which is essentially about journalism, um, yeah, and, and the Iraq War. I, um, I, in college, I got really into, um, you know, like World War Three magazine, like mm -hmm. Peter Cooper, um, a lot of that stuff. I also like have a lot of like prose is a lot of my go tos. Also, like, uh, like I was coming up in the nineties um, with like Chris Rock and like a lot of. So I, it's like really hard for me not to approach topics without irony and humor, um, both because life is really funny <laughs> and sad and weird, um, and also um, <clears throat> just having like a like I'm an anarchist, um, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the things that I, I read uh, about issues are like um, writings by anarchists or um, uh, like black freedom fighters, like uh, Russell Maroon Schultz. Um, and you, these are stories about them, uh, and they context, and then they write about their greater context, uh, which is what what I try to do. Um, and they really talk about agency, their own agency. Um, so those are tend to be more inspirations than um, comics that I read. Mm. When I was younger, like my favorite things to read were like atlases and like medical illustration things, and, and it's kind of strange. But like I liked how thing like information was condensed in a way that was both like fun to look at as well as like clear. Um, and from then, like you know, it's been cool for me to discover the whole field of graphic medicine in the past few years, which is this like hybrid of comics and medicine and health, and it brings together people from all different disciplines. So when I think about that, I think about people like Creota Wilberg. She has a book out from Uncivilized about, um, like, pretty much about how to draw correctly and how to prevent injury. Um, so that's one thing that comes to mind. Macinaro, he's done stuff for Popular Science and for the Nib. He did a great piece on vaccines. Sarah Glynn is another person I think makes ex excellent work. Lauren Weinstein, like, just a lot of people I could go on and on. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I apologize, by the way, for the cutoff on the images. There's not much we can do. Um, when you're working in, when you're, we're knee deep here at SPX, which is the indie comic scene, which favors the idea of the art to auteur work. And like you do it all yourself. You make, you write, you draw, you 
you know, you publish it even yourself. But a lot of these things, I'm working for the NIB, and I think a lot, a couple of you guys here um, will often uh, collaborate with other with other writers or artists and to to make work. And I'm curious what that. Um, has been experience has been like for you, especially working on when, when you're trying to get information, specific inf types of information across, not necessarily just tell a story, but also convey some situation or experience. And um, what it's been like to have to maybe work with someone, especially if that person isn't necessarily uh, maybe stepping outside the world of comics a little bit. Yeah, for me, what comes to mind um, is like a lot of the comics that I was most excited about. Um, as a younger artist are things like Adrian Tamina or uh, Chris Ware or Dan Klaus, and they are these kind of self-contained creative forces, right? And they write everything, they draw everything, they don't take a lot of editing, uh, they kind of, uh, all the ideas are entirely theirs, but um, that's kind of an arbitrary, re like there's no real reason to approach making all comics or all journalism that way, and there's so many great examples of things being better through collaboration, right? Whether though it's the Marvel bullpen or it's like newsrooms throughout the 20th century, right. there's just so many great things that you can do when you're working with people. And so I think all of us have worked with uh, as a writer or as an illustrator, um, and yeah, you can end up with a better product sometimes and it just takes so long to do everything especially with comics journalism it's just like it's it's silly it's silly to do all that yourself like yeah yeah because coming from the world of journalism where i where i work it's like you have to rely on uh, your fellow reporters or photographers or other people to help you know it's it's collaboration is essential if you're going to get your story out yeah. that day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely this whole thing in the indie comms community to do it all yourself, and that's how I came up doing it. Um, but I also think there's a lot of value in being able to work with other people and to work with editors. I think it can definitely make your work stronger because often we have blind spots uh, you know, regarding our work. And not only that, but having people who are going to fact check your work, and make, and that's which is especially important when you're doing comics journalism. Um, I think it's good to have the ability to do that. And yeah, it takes, it takes time. Like sometimes I'll just write a piece and somebody and they'll have somebody else draw it just because I might be working on something else and it's easier and it's more time effective to, to do it that way. I did a collaboration uh, earlier in the year, I guess it's sort of a collaboration where I approached the, uh, Chris Hayes, he has a show on MSNBC and uh, it was an essay he'd written in 2008, um, which, uh, no, it was, he wrote it in 2006 or during the height of the Iraq war. And it was about how Saving Private Ryan um, sort of primed us for this idea of like a good war that we could go in and win. It was sort of this late 90s idea that we missed this World War II uh, good positive war. Um, so it was an awesome sort of collaboration because I didn't really collaborate at all. I just took his essay and he said that was okay for me to do that. <laughs> um, but it was really fun for me because I also had this thing where I'm used to working like generating my own material and it was like it was a good exercise to take my uh, like my voice and my like the way I make cartoons and apply it to someone else's content and I think to bring something else out in it um, like I think it was about the Iraq war but it was like also said a lot about like present day um, you know what's happening um, with nationalism and in today's world um, so I really like that. I'm doing another one. Um, there's another writer. His name is David Roberts, and he's like a he does journalism on uh, he does reporting on climate. Um, and um, again, I'm taking something that's a bit older, um, but by by making it into comics, I feel like I'm going to change sort of the meaning and the context of it. Um, this is more about like it's it's a thing about climate. It's about uh, how we can't present a, uh, a an argument to conservatives. Uh, to act on climate change, we essentially have to just sort of disregard them. Um, and but uh, like I, I'm fascinated. With, like I drive around all the time, and I see all these bumper stickers, and I think like you can sort of see people going crazy, like on the backs of their cars, like what they're sticking on there. Like I feel like it's just like nuts. Um, and I really just want on all these visuals that like so I'm gonna the whole thing is gonna be set like um, in like a, in the traffic, and, uh, and that's sort of not what was there before. But I think comics will bring something new to this piece. Um, so this is a fun thing to do because I don't have to write it and 
<laughs> are you more? Are you worried about this? Like, with, especially with the MSNBC uh, piece on the, the Greatest Generation. That was that comic, yeah. right? Like about getting it right. Did you worry about how any like how the original author would perceive that? Well, I get permission. I don't. But I mean, like, <laughs> did you feel? Did you feel any kind of obligation? I, I guess to a certain to, nice to the piece. I mean, I felt obligation, yeah, because I, I wanted to do a good piece. Yeah. Um, like so, I feel, and I, and I like the piece. That's why I, like, that's why I went to the effort to approach him. Um, but it's sort of a nice thing to deal with people outside of comics. Cause I think they're just thrilled that you're making comics. Um, like, so they're like, wow, <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> um, I don't have much experience. Um, specifically like with reportage collaborating i mean i i definitely think there's an advantage as someone uh who draws to uh to like try to accommodate like another voice like what you produce becomes a new voice uh, particularly as like someone who normally does do everything myself um that's like that's a great challenge i mean the what I have much more experience is, is being edited, and I'm not sure if we're going to talk about that specifically. That's my next question. Oh, <laughs> okay. um, and uh, I mean, for me, uh, when the Nib hired me, I was not doing uh, journalistic stuff. Um, I have uh, mixed feelings about about um, the standards of journalism, um, a tendency towards uh, trying to present neutrality. Um, taking away um, your subject subjectivity, I th feel like that's largely an illusion. Um, both as um, coming from an individual journalist and also pretending that uh, the companies that whatever are creating a platform don't have um, agency, but also uh, intention. Um, and I think that's important. And it was interesting going into it, and I, I've mostly worked for the NIB, I worked for one other website uh, doing a story about um, someone allegedly defa defacing a, a racist mural in Philadelphia. Um, but it, it was interesting, uh, or it can be frustrating because I, uh, particularly at, you know, as, a, as a black author, I write in a particular way, and, I, um, and there is, because of uh, what well, the, the comics community is very white, um, and there's already a necessary amount of code switching, or it's something that I had felt has necessary over time, but sometimes there can be a lot of pushback where I'll write about something that, to me, uh, in my community, these are givens, and I don't have to explain it, and the editor is like, no, you have to explain it. <laughs> um, uh, so there can be a, an element of uh, tension uh, there. What's an example of something that you had to explain? Um, I was just talking, <laughs> talking to Brendan about this. Okay, so I, I did a story about Martin Luther King. Um, in the very beginning, I, uh, I made a reference to uh, the FBI, at the very least having a hand in Martin Luther King's murder. Uh, I don't feel like I knew to explain this or qualify it, um, because a lot of people uh, that I know just know that this is a given, and I got received some pushback about that. Um, and I was like, this feels crazy that I'm getting a pushback about it. But I was like, I don't know, maybe my editor's white. I guess that's... The <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there can be some things, there can be some language things where um, someone, some, my editor could just maybe uh, use Urban Dictionary and, um, <laughs> uh, or figure out what I'm saying in context. Um, right. so, so these things can be frustrating and um, uh, standards of whiteness can be uh, foisted upon me. Uh, Without without knowledge, these right. are uh, good reasons to have um, lots of different kinds of editors. Well, or, let, um, let's continue. More worldly editors. Let's continue down that because um, also, like in comics and especially in indie comics, uh, I think here because you often self-publish, it's so DIY. You know, even if you have a book publisher or an author, they tend to be very hands-off. And I imagine in working, I don't I don't know what the nib is like, but even like working for any kind of if you're the New Yorker or the Atlantic or any of these places, you know, they're going to have a much heavier hand, even if they perceive it as being gentle. So um, I am curious to hear what you what it's like to especially you know doing something, whether it's an essay or an actual kind of report, on the scene reporting, what that experience has been like, and if good and bad. I love it. I don't know. Personally, like, I love like the feeling that people are paying attention and somebody else is like thinking about my work at the same time that I am. Um, and yeah, working like, I've done some pieces for the Atlantic's website, and 
Um, they, like a lot of old legacy media organizations, have a standard of like each independent assertion has to be fact checked, right? Like everything that you say that's happening needs to be checked by somebody else, and that's great, you know. <laughs> like I wish that every place had the resources to try for something like that, but um, but yeah, right. It, it it can seem personal sometimes, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think overall I've had a pretty good experience. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the hardest times are like if I have a certain detail that I think is really important to the story that like is my take on it but is deemed to not be relevant and they're like, cut it. And i like, what am I going to do sometimes? Just have to cut it. Um, but overall, yeah, it's, it's been helpful. Sometimes I... Just because I understand something, sometimes I ex I can initially explain it in a way that I think people will understand, but then to have other people read it and be like, that's actually not clear because I'm not coming from that background, mm. that's, that's really helpful to have. Um, I, yeah, so I, I suppose I also come from that, um, this idea that, you know, the whole Indianomics, like, you know, sort of aversion to editor editing, I had to sort of get over that. I actually really love it now. I really do like people... Um, paying attention to what I'm doing and like, like, someone put it once uh, after I th um, after I think I disregarded edits on like a graphic novel, <laughs> like uh, that you're never gonna have someone read your work at that closely, um, you know, and but I think it's probably important to like really have somebody whose opinion you you like you respect or that you are, you're in, in, interested in letting them have that sort of control over your work, right. so. Like so, I've, I think I feel very fortunate. The Nib, I have like a really good relationship with Larry Harris, who's the, the editor there. I just do all my work with her. Yeah, so. it's nice when it's like a two-way street, and you don't feel like you have to take every single edit. Like you can negotiate, you can ask questions, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, sometimes it's like there's no time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. A good editor relationship is worth its weight in gold, I find. But that's not always the case. Um, let's talk about research. When you're given a topic or you've picked a topic to investigate, how, mu how much research do you do and how, whether that involves interviewing people or going to the library or just grabbing a topic and deciding this is what I'm going to cover, even if you have a personal take on it or it's something that happened to you, I imagine, uh, Ben, I, you mean a lot of the comics you do often you're in there, or it's about things that did happen to you, but I imagine even then, there's things you have to um, go back and fact check, or look up, look up and, and get right. So can we can you guys talk a little about that? Yeah. Go for it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think particularly the way that I thought about how I wanted to approach uh, comics that, that I did for the Nib and other things, you know, since it came with the age of Trump, and people did seem to be wondering in many cases like how to respond um, to what felt uh, new and dangerous, at least to some people, to a lot of people. Um, and it felt important for me to, to be in these places, particularly because there's a lot of fear of, of danger, which is, which is valid, uh, but danger is also, I don't know, that's part of society um, and you can't always avoid it. But also, you know, there's like a lot of opportunity in the streets. So anyway, um, so in one hand, I don't want to have a comic where it's just me talking, so I feel motivated to do interviews. Uh, I'm not there for everything. Also something that I think that I bring to the nib that maybe is different, uh, because I've been part of uh, uh, radical politics for a long time, part of punk, part of squat culture. Um, uh, in the instance of like uh, Charlottesville, uh, it's very easy for me to uh, get in a room with anti-fascists that were there that will talk to me who won't talk to anyone else um, And for me to like even if the interview doesn't end up in the comic It's a perspective that I feel like I can get that a lot of people can't um, So a lot of the things that I do I do I do interviews uh, and I do I do do research I try to research things a lot particularly because the like I did the Charlottesville um, article, but my prompt was the ACLU <laughs> and I actually started writing about um, Charlottesville because there was a Klan rally way before that um, and then it eventually, you know, Charlottesville happened and then it turned into that. Um, so, so yeah, so I try to like, I try to ground, I think there, there's been, a, been some other things, but I try to ground things in something that feels like very street level. Um, so yeah, so a lot of interviews kind of adds to that so you feel like you got a lot of voices and yeah. I think I answered. You want to go? 
Yeah, I haven't done as much like um, on the ground reporting. I mean, I did one where I interviewed my grandmother, but like that's, that's a little different. Um, <laughs> But uh, I do a lot of yeah, research-based work where it takes me a while to just compile stuff. And I think due to some of the subjects I write about, I have to be extra careful about it. Like, for instance, I did a piece on called What is Race, where I was pretty much breaking down a lot of misconceptions about these ideas we have about biological race. And that's a touchy subject. I did it when like the whole alt-right thing was starting to spike like around the tr uh, election of Trump, and I felt like I needed to like kind of deal with some of the misinformation that was rampant. Um, and so that was one where I had to be extra, extra careful about making sure that all of the, informa the scientific information I was getting was like well you know researched and and all of that um, and of course there's always some pushback I like you know had quotes from like Charles Murray's a bell curve and Charles Murray actually ended up reading it and making some passive-aggressive comment which is cool <laughs> <laughs> but um, even like I did one in January on pandemics and that was another one um, because there's so many um, people with so many different opinions about vaccines for instance or um, just lack of information about public health, um, I had to also be very delicate about trying to make sure that all the information I had was carefully researched and clear. That's a, that's a good point because when you're, when you're talking about these, if you're coming from a subjective viewpoint, you want to make sure that you're, what you're talking about, you can say, look, I've, I've got this stuff that backs it up. Yeah. My viewpoint is not coming from just my opinion that I'm pulling out of the clouds. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I did do a strip about the NFL and race, um, and I did a lot of research for that one. Um, I felt probably most the self-conscious about that, <laughs> that strip. Um, like it was about, it was just, I read an interesting, um, uh, I read an interesting fact about how uh, NFL players tend to be whiter the closer they get to the center of the line. Um, so the quarterback and the guy who does the snap and the sa these are the safer positions. These, these people have longer careers. Um, but so I had to do a lot of research like to sort of make that into a, um, a comic. Um, and that's probably the most I have done. Um, the the example of a comic I have that's where it's more like on the ground is the one that I think this panel's from. A, um, oh, was that the NFL one? Yeah. Okay. Um, but you mean I think was it this, this one? Is this one where I was where I was I went to I went to just um, it was a, 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 a like a rally for dreamers in the, in my hometown. Um, I just made a comic about it after the fact, like after what had happened, and I sort of created this um, op-ed comic. There was so there wasn't much in the way of. Um, like fact checking or sort of establishing that these facts did happen. Right. Um, it's quite, I don't know the nib doesn't have the resources, and I wasn't thinking at the time anyway. To, <laughs> but you know, whatever. Too bad, Trumper. <laughs> <laughs> You're up there. Um, there was all, and one last thing was uh, I did do one. Um, actually, that's irrelevant. So forget that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I love the writing and the reporting and the researching. Probably the best. I mean, I uh, I don't know. Everybody's a little bit different, but since I came later to drawing. Uh, the penciling is like the hardest work for me and the part that I like, yeah, it, I just want to get through. Um, but the actual, I spend as much time on the front end writing as I do on the back end drawing usually. And I don't know if that's normal for you guys, but um, yeah, I love getting a lot of books out of the library. I love talking to people on the phone. Um, I love, I don't know, just putting a lot of stuff together because um, I'm freelance, I think a bunch of, we all do freelance work, and um, it's just a lot of keeping track of things that interest you, that you can come back to later, that might be something, right? Like, might be a story or not, but maybe it'll go into another story down the road. But um, yeah, I love that part of it, of like, that just collecting little bits to come together later. That's a really quick side question, too. Like, what about visual research? Because I imagine when you're doing this stuff, you have to not only know the facts, but if, like, I'm thinking of the story you did on Flint, mm -hmm. that I have, like, you've got to probably have to find what Flint looked like at mm -hmm. the time you're writing about it. Yeah, that part's really fun. I mean, like, uh, sometimes it comes in really counterintuitive places. Like, I looked at a lot of um, Ebony and Jet magazines from the 60s to make sure, like, I had some, like, relevant haircuts, you know, for, like, <laughs> 60s, like, African Americans in Flint, like, um, and, yeah, like, you get what you can. I think, like, um, you do as, this, my personal standard for it is, like, you get as much visual information as is uh, possible within, like, a reasonable, uh, you know, time frame, and, like, 
I think the bare minimum is like if you're drawing a comic in winter in the Northeast United States, like don't have leaves on the trees. You know what I mean? Like it should be common sense. It should make sense, and you don't have to like research where every single stone was in every like if you're reconstructing an event. Um, it's cartooning. It's great. You can like generalize, um, but yeah, don't like lie you know <laughs> like there is like a very basic journalistic tool set about ethics and not like misleading people and that's relevant for the visuals too mm -hmm. in my experience yeah, yeah. add anything <laughs> um let's let's talk about um deadlines a little bit because i feel like with because <laughs> one of the, yeah i know uh, car cartoon comics always deadlines are always frantic but you know in, in my in my day job like when the news is happening you got to get it out right away. It's done. It's there. Like there's a fire. Get the story up right now. Like as accurate as you can, but get it up now. Yeah. Um, that might be a little different from what you're doing, but there's also this: you want to be able to be talking about what's happening in the culture now. You want to be talking about the issues that are that are happening now, and not you know six months from now. And comics take a long time to make. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you find that? I'm, I'm interested if you guys find that a, a struggle at all. Do you find it um, to juggle like the the amount of time it can take to make a comic depend versus wanting to be able to report on something in a timely fashion or convey information in a timely fashion. Yeah, I find you know that, like it's balancing newsworthiness with like general interest and like evergreen stories that people will always want to read. Um, there's a lot of great overlap between the kind of comics that a lot of us do and the kind of like um, long reads that people like to read on the internet, like long magazine pieces. Um, those are have a similar kind of space in the culture where they are kind of happening in general, but not maybe like tied to something that's happening this weekend. I mean, maybe if you're lucky. Um, what's kind of nice about uh, it's weird to say this, but what is a little nice about the kind of era that we're living in and like. Uh, Trump being the president of the United States is that almost everything is newsworthy. Like there is a potential hook for like almost any topic you would want to talk about, whether it's the environment or the justice system or whatever. You know, there's a way to tie it into something that people really care about right now. So um, it's not like it makes it any better, but you know, it's it's a nice thing for that at least. I mean, it does feel like just with the 24-hour news cycle and the way that Trump is. And the media's relationship to Trump, it feels like there's just too much news too fast. Like it's there's yeah. breaking yeah. news all the time. I mean, I do think one of the disadvantages of like a long form journalistic comic is that it just takes so long. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah. So that's a it, just in terms of it being news, that's a disadvantage. Um, there's been like a th I think three stories that I did that were like needed felt like they needed to come out immediately. There was the. Um, the story, the comic I did about uh, New Orleans Confederate monuments, um, the one about the Rizzo mural, because the city of Philadelphia is really talking about whether or not to remove it, um, and also the, the Charlottesville piece, which felt, you know, there were takes coming out, but I was like, I really need, feel like I need to, to do something on this. Um, I don't know. I Like, <laughs> deadlines become, like, uh, for me, uh, just I never hit them number one ever <laughs> ever 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 um, and uh, yeah I don't I don't know like it's it's a tough balance I feel like I feel like just in the for me for the production of comic comics you're always like making compromises and I feel like it's like for for me I need to make sure that I'm making the right compromises in a short period of time mm. um, and you know like you're saying like like comics are more like a long read for me like the advantage of comics is not that they're timely or that necessarily like what you're getting is like what is happening mm -hmm. but like that you're getting um like a like a like a resonant representation of like what's happening for me i'm like like for everything i'm not just talking about like what is happening i'm trying to like present concepts that are going on and for me like I said like I'm not really trying to do balanced concepts like I'm not giving I'm not giving like the pro monument people a voice right <laughs> I'm giving a context for the resistance um, yeah and uh, that's that's important to me 
Yeah, I mean, I think I'm always just trying to get more efficient in terms of how I can do these comics. Um, I mean, when I'm doing a longer comics essay, often the topic is something where it's not as like immediate, so I can take a little more time with it. But I did do a few, like I did one before the election, it was like Clinton versus Trump on abortion. And that had to come out, like that was around the debates and like right before people were going to vote. So that had to get out like immediately. And then there was one on uh, Trump care versus Obamacare. That was right before they were getting set to vote. And that was like right to the line. Like if it had been like a day later, it probably would have been irrelevant. So that like, f I think things like that I find to be very <laughs> stressful. And I like, I prefer to do some of the longer form ones. Um, but yeah, um, I think that's also another reason why sometimes it can be good to work with other people if one person's faster at drawing, for instance, and one person's quicker at writing, and you can pair them together and, the, and you can get it out quicker. Um, and another thing I would say, this is like a bit of a tangent, but sometimes like things come up in the news that are sensitive and personal and like you feel that and like sometimes if you're asked to write about it you might not be ready to write about it and so I think that's something that we have to talk about too, mm -hmm. especially like a lot of instances of hate crimes, like there is a need to report on those things, but I felt in s certain situations where I just needed to step back and not report on that, and I think that's something uh, to, that needs to be respected as well. Yeah. That's good. Um, um, so the deadlines I generally work with, um, like uh, it's, it's usually about five to like eight or nine weeks. Um, so it, I think that's, is that short or long? <laughs> Seems long. I, mean, I wish I had that kind of yeah. <laughs> So that's okay, yes. Yeah, right. You guys impressed? Yeah. <laughs> I hate you now, Mike. Yeah, but I mean, I like the idea of deadlines and actually, and definitely have that thing where like a, a, a piece will take uh, almost exactly as long as whatever the deadline is. Um, and since I'm trying more to like make this more viable like financially, like a deadline helps me because I feel like if I sort of keep right. things moving, like it will be like more like a realistic thing. It's a good motivating force. So nine weeks is not that great to get paid once every night. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and for the editors that are listening, I always come in on deadlines. So. <laughs> <laughs> always. I, I didn't even assume otherwise. Um, that was subtle. <laughs> uh, you guys are throwing, I mean, in these comics that you guys are doing, you, there's a lot of information you're throwing out. And you, and you have to often deal with a lot of abstract ideas and figures, and sometimes you're portraying like an interview and it's someone, like the story is about that person, like that, that one story you did on the HIV um, mm -hmm. advocate. And yeah. how do you convey, like, an in, like a, for use of a better term, info dump. How do you convey when you, you've got a lot of facts and figures and you've got this pile of information and how do you, how do you convey that in comics so that people can understand it and keep reading and, and it doesn't, it's not just a wall of text to them. And also along the same lines, and I think this is really important to journalism because for me when I started becoming a reporter I learned, I had to learn how, what not to write and what to take out. And that was like when, you, when you're writing, when you're reporting, and like you get all this information, you have this great interview, and there's so many good quotes, and you've got all this good information, and you have to get rid of it all, because really all you want is this one line. Yeah. And, and that's the key, and that's the only part that matters. So I guess so. It's two, a two-part question is, like, how, do you, how do you convey information in comics visually to, to make it interesting and engaging? And with all that research you've done, how do you edit yourself? Yeah, I mean, there's like a range of abstraction that's like that's used in comics, right? Like, it, there's editorial cartoons where it's like the rich guy holding like a big sack that says like the national debt on it or whatever, right? <laughs> like we've all seen that before, or like Doonesbury where like the president is depicted as a cowboy hat or something like that, and um, that has its place, um, but. A lot of us are dealing with uh, either pretty serious subjects or representing like real individuals, and it's only fair to them to portray them, you know, as realistically as we can, uh, and that works in the comic and is like is true to that person, you know. Um, like uh, my standard for the cartoon Picayune, the whole time I was editing it, is that every single person portrayed in one of the stories has to be a real person. I didn't want to have like um, combine different ideas and different people into like an amalgamation. Um, that's just was my standard. Everybody's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, for me, like there's a visual authenticity that you owe the source just the same way that you would quote them the right way. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, just in terms of, because I feel like Alari would have um, a bunch to say about how much content I put in initially. <laughs> I get lots of frustrated emails being like, you need to cut half of it. Um, but I mean, that being said, uh, if what I'm doing is like too wordy, then I know that I don't know what I'm talking about enough mm -hmm. uh, to write about it for other people. So that's one. Like, I feel like I really need to inhabit like what I'm talking about. Um, also, just in terms of, you know, like I had a professor that, that said like, um, what, what you're depicting is your world, like in totality. And, um, and for me, I, because, because I have a politic that is um, peripheral and I'm working with ideas often that are sort of remote um, and also uh, talking about, like in the instance of Charlottesville, I'm talking, you know, I talked about ACL, ACLU, but then I'm talking about Antifa. I'm talking about the history of Antifa and what they do. So where I'm, I'm writing about like an aspect of a subculture that people, you know, in a lot of cases don't know about that's not familiar to them. So for me, I also don't want to draw like weird, you know, like anthropomorphized like ideas. Like I want to like draw a place that's sort of recognizable and that someone feel like feels like they can inhabit um, in some way, even though it's a cartoon. Um, so yeah, and I want to respect the ideas. Uh, so the only people that I draw like weird, I don't know if you know I have a picture of it, but I draw Richard Spencer with like, Richard Spencer with oh, like I almost, a I mayonnaise jar yeah. <laughs> instead of his face. A jar of mayonnaise. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, so you can, you can break down if dehumanizing is necessary for violence. Um, mm. Whatever, we can talk about that. But um, <laughs> like symbols have a purpose and yeah, work, yeah. yeah, like, yeah. Mostly I don't want to draw racists. Like when I, I got, I got to draw <laughs> so many that. cops, y'all. Like, uh, man, I can just from memory with my eyes closed, I can just draw a police uniform. Um, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, I feel, I feel like there's a lot of things to consider. Like the, the visuals also need to give you information that doesn't need to be said in your writing. And I've always tended to be on the wordier side, and I've had to work on that as time has went on. Um, with the pandemic piece, for instance, I was trying to explain the concept of why isolationism doesn't work when there's a pandemic, at which Trump believes that, you know, you, like, you know, stop people from coming into the country, you, like, seal off the countries, and, like, so I had to draw, like, a, an idea of, like, if you were in a burning building and you were trying to, you know, keep yourself in your room and like you know tape up the door like that's like the same thing so like that's a way of like kind of giving information without having to like explain it um another thing is just like yeah i don't know um it, it is helpful like when editors like kind of keep reminding you so what, what are you trying to actually say and i was doing a piece on shirley chisholm and that was something where i had this whole bit on how she had this like friendship with george wallace who is this segregationist from the south and she went to visit him in the hospital when he after he had been shot and how it was this like really interesting bizarre relationship and she's like yeah but how is that related and i'm like <laughs> but it's interesting but like does it make the point about her legacy and so like sometimes you just have to make those calls where you're like yeah but like I'm trying to talk about the the length of her career and the the main substantial things that she's done that most people know about. That's that's like secondary reading. Um, so that is, I think, when an editor is especially important is when you can't see over your own like interests. Um, so yeah. I did a strip uh, for the Nib. Uh, it was a uh, I had gone to a garden party in a nearby town. It was and now New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy was there like giving a speech. And I was trying to write a strip about like feeling good about being a centrist Democrat, but I could not like it because it's what Ben said about like when you keep writing and writing, it's like I can't get to the part where I feel like I'm feel comfortable with what I'm trying to say here because it's so like like it's uh, there's no, I didn't have a clear thing to say and it really was like I was just like making now it's 20 pages long, Larry. Now it's 25 pages. We're gonna figure out you know what my point is here. Um, I feel the. Uh, I think that's a great point. That yeah, like if I'm if it just keeps on going, then I don't actually have something that I'm comfortable saying. Um, the visually, uh, there's one thing I, I've found as an interesting change for my own work is that when I was first doing online editorial strips, I was making it like uh, how that would appear in a book. Like I was like thinking about like this will be in a book one day, so I'm gonna lay it out with a book in mind. 
And I've in the last year or so, I realized that I just need to stop doing that, and I need to think about the web as that's where people are reading this stuff, and I need to make it so they can read it. I have to create it with that vertical scroll and break up the text in a way. Like when you do have a lot of words, like the the Chris Hayes thing was long, but to break it up, um, if you can create good comics, it doesn't really matter how long it is. Um, I did have to chop a bunch out, but you know it was still able to like. People read it, like um, even though it was like probably yeah. one of the longer pieces I'd done. It's also worth like pointing out that you know we're like drawing stuff in little boxes, one. and only so much could fit in the little boxes, <laughs> and like so sometimes you just gotta cut a sentence because it just won't fit with the thing that you want to draw. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to circle back um, to what you were talking about earlier, Ben, um, the idea of objectivity and um, and versus subjectivity and. Um, you know, in journalism, you know, the journalists have this idea, um, at least for the this is past several decades, you know, of being objective um, and not not kind of inserting yourself in the story at the very least. And if you're if you're say covering a Trump rally or whatever, you talk to the people, you interview, and you say what you tell what the event was and what this was the experience of what it was like. This is what happened, and that 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 is more than inserting your own personal opinion. Um, but a lot of the stories you guys are doing do have very subjective viewpoints. You are coming from a, pl a certain specific place. So um, what do you feel about, I mean, what's your point of view of objectivity? Do you consider it to be a myth, journalist of objectivity? Um, do you, are you concerned about being perceived as being too biased or as being too subjective in your work at all? Uh, so you just mentioned something you said about like how it's a relatively new idea that uh, the journalism should be objective. No, I think not I relatively, but I mean, I would think from most of the 20th century. But I think if you go back far enough to the early days of journal, the early days of the, with Pulitzer and Hearst, a lot of newspapers back then were very objective, and there's still, um, you know, if you go to countries, there are there are. Like England has newspapers which are very like this is the liberal paper, this is the centrist yeah. paper, this is the conservative paper. Yeah, because I just I think I learned recently that this is that what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> so but, uh, the AP apparently is supposed to be like the one that's objective. That's yeah, what they're the AP for. is very objective. I mean, yeah. certainly in, in my work in my dev, there's an idea of like regard. Like let's say, you're, let's say you're going to cover the um, the recent. We recently covered the. Um, the Pennsylvania, the Attorney General released a, um, a report on child sex abuse within the Catholic Church clergy. Now, we we go there and we report and we interview and we talk to the victims and we bring the story. I think that by the very act of bringing the story up, we're going to have to. No one's going to say you're not going to get someone to be like, yeah, this is this this isn't a big deal or this is. I mean, just the very act of you're reporting on this and you're interviewing the victims and you're getting their stories is doing it. But at the same time, you're not necessarily. Inter inserting yourself in the story and presenting that's the job of the editor edi editorial board and the op-ed to to bring bring a take on like what the catholic church must do or what what should be done you're there to if i'm there i'm there to maybe you know get video or report on what's being said and what people are saying which is a little bit different mm -hmm. so you know so I'm curious as to what you guys take on, it, especially yeah. considering the work you're doing is you're you're deliberate, consciously inserting yourself in your stories or or providing a a, a take on a story. Yeah. Um. So. So something I noticed uh, after at least immediately upon like Trump's election was that the left was convinced that facts were the things that were going to dethrone him, uh, which I think is is naive, but also. Um, I, I don't know it's like uh, I'll find a word for it later but it's it's um it sort of it uh it sort of overestimates um, ourselves and underestimates you know who might be perceived as our enemy um, I think the so I re I rely a lot in my writings on um, the journalism you're describing when someone goes somewhere they try to give, think that if you I think if you're consuming consuming news, I think that you should never assume there's not some level of curation. I think you should bear that in mind. Right. And I think this idea that we should be only consuming like objective um, like content from the news, I think is misguided. Um, I think also even even something like the AP, which is trying to cover a lot of things, like th this idea, like like news sites decide like what they will accommodate and that's based on the culture that they're in 
and we live in a white supremacist culture. We live in a, a capitalist society, um, right or wrong. So there's certain ideas that will be accommodated within news, and I think that's just outside of the wingnut politics that I'm sure, if you didn't know before, you know I have. Um, <laughs> you, I, I think that that's just something that should be like born in mind. For me, when I'm when I'm when I'm making something, uh, both both as uh, someone who is black and someone who has a, a deep dislike for market capitalism, late capitalism, uh, white supremacy, um, hierarchies, the state, uh, the police state in particular, uh, the prison, blah, 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 you know the list. Um, <laughs> the, um, the counterpoint for my ideas is the meta, is the meta narrative. Um, there is, there is tons of, there has been tons of space um, for the counter arguments for the things that I believe in and for like what I'm presenting, um, either uh, by what people, the quotes, the quotes that I, you know, that I'll write down or like my personal ideas. Um, so I don't feel a personal impetus to give them a platform in the thing that I am making. Um, yeah, personally. Um, and, and also, uh, what I'm gonna say is really uh, hotepi. Um, what is what is the white equivalent of hotep? Um, uh, a cr crunchy? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. There's certain there's certain concepts as we know that don't translate. Um, so so, but the the I, the idea of fact and truth I think are are very Western, um, and and I think that we should have a certain skepticism about those. I mean, I get of the of the uh, critiques I get on the internet, people are constantly trying to debate or being like that's not the truth, and it's the truth is subjective. Mm -hmm. um, and it's certain, a truth. Yeah. Right, right. It's a truth, and we can and in the end like these things break down to recognize each other's humanity, emotions, and stuff like that. And we can start talking, we can talk about numbers, we can talk about accounts, but we should acknowledge that these are accounts. Yeah, I totally agree. I think there, I mean, there is no like perfect viewpoint. There is no complete viewpoint, and there is no like perfect objective truth. And I think the objectivity question skews it a little bit. Mm. But I think for me, like, even as someone who like went to journalism school and believes in NPR and Reuters and AP, and I believe in trying to get people on the record, and I think it's worth the effort. But for me, it's a it's about the effort. It's about um, trying to get everything that you can, and the emphasis for me should be on transparency, on trying to kind of clue everybody in into your process and all the decisions you're making, and also humility, right? Is what you're talking about is recognizing that there's no perfect way to do this and that there are many different viewpoints so um and that like yeah you can even if the very best reporter goes out there like it still something's going to be missing you know and especially with comics um there is no way to avoid the fact that it's being filtered through our hand you know like literally like it's almost the most it's like the best metaphor for subjective journalism because it's our own brain talking to our hand about how we see the world so yeah yeah, and I feel like, I mean, I, for, I can speak for myself as usually when, like, when I propose a longer piece, it's because it's something that I'm interested in. I have to be interested in it to want to spend that much time on it, so already there's a little bit that I'm like self-selecting. Um, but despite that, I still try to be as objective as I can, but of course when I have a comic where I'm inserting myself in it, it's, it's going to be a little bit different, and that's why I call it a comics essay because I'm presenting on a specific topic, but it's from my point of view with that research. And I'll just I'll say something else quickly. I think the most challenging one for me was doing a piece on Chris Christie, um, and because I'm from New Jersey and I, I deeply dislike him, and I wanted to give an account of all of his corruption, and that was the most challenging one to remain objective, but to still kind of try to drive the point across. So yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, I think it's a challenge every single project. Uh, it's not, it's, what I do is not, I don't care. Okay, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There are like 50 more questions I had written down, but unfortunately, I think we're out of time. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, really, really quick, where can people find you if they want to find your books? Really quick. Oh, uh, JoshKramerComics.com. And also, I'd really recommend everyone in this room go to KojoList.com, because it's everything we're talking about, and it's a regular newsletter. So. Cool. Um, I'm at table J3A. Um, you can find me on Instagram. Um, I, you know, do a lot of stuff for the Nib. My books are sold through Silver Sprocket. A lot of people have been asking me about where to start 
uh, when reading about anarchism specifically, because I recognize I'm one of the few anarchists um, anywhere. Um, so uh, uh, crimethink.com is a publisher that produces a lot of like very uh, easy to read, easy to entrance concepts. It's uh, think with a C, I'm almost positive. Um, I'm at D13 with Radiator Comics, and I also am selling um, Comics for Choice, um, which I was a co-editor on and just won the Ignatz last night. So you can pick it up there if you want. I'll be signing uh, my book at the Uncivilized book, uh, Books table for an hour, and then you can follow me on Twitter. It's Mike underscore Dawes. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Thanks, guys. Chris. I have a round of applause. <laughs>